Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the guest speaker program of the US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. I'm the Institute's Executive Director, Catherine Wilhelm. This is our second talk in a series of uh, guest speaker events that we're calling uh, Taiwan Legal. Last week, we had uh, Richard Bush, a fellow at the Brookings Institution and former head of the American Institute in Taiwan, answering the question, what does US law say about Taiwan? Uh, and he explained the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, which is the main piece of legislation that governs uh, US interaction with the self-governed island of Taiwan. And the recording of that talk is available on our website and our YouTube channel for those of you who weren't able to catch it live. Some listeners may have been surprised by his observation that the Taiwan Relations Act does not actually commit the US government to sell weapons to Taiwan, nor does it commit the US government to come to the assistance of Taiwan in the event of a conflict. Um, relevant to today's topic, um, Richard Bush uh, pointed out that the TRR to the TAR uh, says that in many specific ways, the US government shall treat Taiwan as if it were a state. But it doesn't say whether the United States regards Taiwan as a state or not. So this week, we are asking, what does international law say about Taiwan? And this analysis is more complex, <laughs> even, than the analysis of what US law has to say. And here to unpack it for us is Peter Dutton, who is a senior research scholar at the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School. He's also a familiar face here at NYU Law School because he's been a non-resident affiliated scholar of our institute for quite some time and also uh, an adjunct professor of law teaching a course on China's view of international law. Before he joined Yale this year, he was a professor of international law at the Stockton Center for International Law of the US Naval War College. So today's program, we're going to begin with some opening remarks from Peter, and then, as usual, I'll ask a few questions and begin taking questions from the audience, both those of you who are in the room and also those of you who are, are online. If you're online, please use the Q&A uh, function in Zoom rather than the chat function. So with that, Peter, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. It's a pleasure to see you again and to, uh, to be here at NYU again. Um, I watched Richard Bush's presentation and I thought it was terrific. I was sort of left uh, at, at that point uh, with, uh, imagining that you would have been asking how is it that U.S. policy um, can be as, as Richard Bush described it, which is um, <laughs> layers of ambiguity about, uh, about uh, various aspects of the relationship between the, the government of the United States and the government on Taiwan. Um, and it, it all boils down to uh, ambiguity about the legal status of the territory of Taiwan and the Pungu Islands. It all comes down to that sort of central core issue. Um, the, the research that I, uh, that I generated, uh, I've actually been working on it for about a year and a half, um, uh, in, in depth for about a year and a half. Um, the research that I generated um, was, was um, spurred on by a request to write a paper um, with the, to the topic was, um, what is the status of Taiwan and what collective self-defense rights might it have? So I have a draft chapter um, that, uh, that, be, that begins to analyze those two questions. I'm really just today here focused on what's the legal status of the island of Taiwan itself since this is, uh, it builds on what Richard Bush said. As I said, this is a work in progress. It's, this is, there's so much material to get your arms around uh, uh, that it really requires multiple years uh, to do a, a good job. But I think I've come up with a pretty solid initial uh, aspect about this particular question. Uh, um, it's a legal analysis as well, not a policy analysis. I, I have to say that um, oftentimes when we look at what the law concludes about a particular topic, we, we can stand back from that and say that's not how it should be. Um, and what I, but what I concluded was that's how in fact it is. Um, in terms of what the law is and what the law says. So I want to, to at least 
point out uh, th that sometimes we're going to hear tensions um, between the policies and what we think the law should be and what the law really frankly currently is as it stands. The last thing I'd like to say before I discuss the, the, the details is that as I go through this, I acknowledge I have biases. Um, I, I have a bias in favor of democracy, for instance. And so I'm sure that that affects my analysis. Um, and I want to acknowledge that right up front. But uh, I really did the best I could do to uh, research the law in relationship to each of the specific claims that uh, the PRC makes about, about the status of, uh, of Taiwan, to see if each one of those holds water in light of the law. So um, that's the, the introductory uh, elements of what I think you should know before we start. I'm going to focus on, on a, a history, a sort of a baselining of the history that, that resulted in each of the key elements of, uh, of the legal arguments about the status of, of Taiwan. And so we can then have a discussion. I'll, I'll try to keep my presentation rather short. Uh, so here's where the PRC begins the conversation. There's one uh, China in the world. Taiwan is an inalienable part of China. And the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government representing the whole of China. This is a, this is a claim that is a claim of sovereignty over the territory of Taiwan and the right to govern that territory. Uh, and so uh, pulling that apart, there was a time when, the, when, when there was undisputed sovereignty of China over, uh, actually it was the Qing dynasty that was the undisputed sovereign over uh, the territory of, of Taiwan and the Pungu Islands. Um, and there was a conflict in 1894 and, eight, and it ended in 1895 and in April 1895, the Treaty of Shimonoseki was signed by which the territory of Taiwan and the Pungu Islands was ceded formally by treaty to, from China to Japan, from the Qing Dynasty to Japan. Um, it, it, at that point, um, everyone acknowledged that this island uh, was Japanese. It was part of the Japanese Empire during that period of time uh, from uh, uh, nine, uh, from 1895 until at least uh, 1941. So what began uh, uh, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was a couple of things. One was uh, the conflict that had been going on between Japan and China, which was unacknowledged as a war, um, immediately after the American entry into war with Japan, China entered into war with a con uh, uh, conflict as a war with Japan. And at that point in time, uh, the Chinese government, the re Republican government, um, uh, abrogated or purported to abrogate all of the treaties that it had signed with, with Japan. Um, and so we'll come back to that, to that point. But that's the first historical point. So this is actually December 8th, uh, 1941, the abrogation of, of all treaties uh, up until that point. Um, and in uh, 1943, uh, as the war uh, sort of raged on, uh, the British, the Americans, and the Chinese met in Cairo to uh, lay out the conduct of the, the rest of the war. And one of the things that they were able to agree on, actually, frankly, only the only thing that they were able to agree on was that uh, it would be, uh, that, that Taiwan and the Pungu Islands, upon the defeat of Japan, would be returned to China. This was followed then by the inclusion of the other major ally, the Russians, the uh, Soviets at that time, uh, at Potsdam. And here you have uh, Churchill and now Truman, Churchill and Truman uh, and Stalin at Potsdam. So Roosevelt has since died. Truman is now president. So now you have the, the fourth uh, member of, uh, of the allies um, agreeing at, the, at Potsdam to implement the uh, Cairo Accords, Cairo, uh, Cairo Agreement. Then uh, Japan surrendered. Uh, this is the surrender uh, in Tokyo Bay on the USS Missouri, uh, the surrender ceremony. Um, and Japan signed a surrender agreement at that point, agreeing to abide by the uh, provisions of uh, the Potsdam uh, Accord, right? So you have a line of, of, of agreements from Cairo to Potsdam to uh, the, the decks of the, of the Missouri and Tokyo Bay. So what happened next? The next thing that happened was uh, the Republican gov government uh, 
sent a representative, or actually representatives, uh, to uh, Taipei to accept the Japanese surrender. This happened a couple of months later. It happened in mid, uh, late October, actually, uh, of 1945. And uh, and and the the uh, there was a there was a formal surrender process that uh, that played out. Um, here you see the uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, uh, generals going through that formal surrender process. Um, and so now uh, uh, the Republican uh, government of China took possession of the island of Taiwan. Right. So you have you have um, uh, Cairo. Oh, you, ha you, you have the the um, Abrogation Declaration, you have Cairo, you have Potsdam, you have the Surrender Agreement, and now you have uh, the acceptance of surrender. It was the American policy uh, in the Truman administration up until this, the very end, actually June 25th, 6th, and 7th of uh, 1950. It was the policy of the Truman administration to complete the agreement that uh, Roosevelt had made at Cairo. Uh, and to and to hand over uh, Taiwan and the Pungu Islands to uh, to to China uh, in the formal um, uh, peace treaty that would follow the conflict. That was Truman's policy as well as Roosevelt's policy until North Korea attacked South Korea on the Korean Peninsula. And at that point, uh, Truman believed that Stalin was. Uh, attempting to take advantage of allied uh, weakness and to expand uh, communist control across Eurasia, both in Asia, in the Middle East, and in Europe. There were actions that were simultaneous that caused Truman some concern, and he changed the policy overnight, changed the policy about uh, what would be the American position regarding the future of Taiwan. And this was that the determination of the future status of, it was at the time called Formosa, of course, uh, the determination of the future status of Formosa must await the restoration of security in the Pacific. So the next action was the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Now re recall that even though the conflict ended with a, uh, the surrender agreement in 1945, that's not the same thing as a peace treaty ending the formal state of hostilities. That actually occurred as a legal matter. A peace treaty ends the formal state of hostilities, not a surrender agreement. And so the, the, uh, the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty um, uh, is one in which uh, Japan was required to renounce its sovereignty over Taiwan and the Pungu Islands, but at which no other party was assigned sovereignty. And that process of severing sovereignty to territory and assigning sovereignty to territory has been the process of the movement of territory at the end of a conflict through a peace treaty uh, historically for hundreds of years. That includes, for instance, we can come back and talk about this, um, the, the multiple times that Alsace and Lorraine uh, were traded between Germany and France at various periods of time. Um, France occupied Alsace and Lorraine at the end of uh, the Napoleonic Wars, um, and, uh, and yet it wasn't until the peace treaty was signed that that transfer actually occurred. And that actually occurred a couple of times um, during, during uh, the conflict between France and Germany. So that's not unusual. The uh, second treaty was signed because the, there was no Chinese representative at the San Francisco Peace Treaty. So a second separate peace treaty was signed by the Republic of China uh, in 1952. Um, uh, I, I think it was actually signed in 1951 and effective in 1952, if my memory serves. But um, it was uh, uh, one in which the recognition of the renunciation um, was accepted. But note that there was no additional claim of a resumption of sovereignty over Taiwan and the Pungu Islands in that treaty either. We're going to fast forward now to uh, about, first of all, there's almost 20 years of Cold War in between. Uh, and then there's a point in time in which the United States uh, and uh, the People's Republic of China decided to uh, to try to end the Cold War thaw or to thaw the Cold War between them. Um, and Richard Nixon went to China in February 1972 and uh, came to political agreements with uh, with Zhou Enlai. You see here in the picture Zhou Enlai, but with with Chinese leaders. 
Uh, and, uh, and I think, frankly, the United States was rather, rather duplicitous in its process, how it went about this. Because on February 22nd, 1972, Richard Nixon said in words to Zhou Enlai, there's one China, Taiwan is a part of China, and you shall hear no more about, uh, uh, about that from us. But, he also said, I have a bureaucracy and a government I have to deal with, and I'm not going to be able to be that explicit in writing. So it was Nixon's policy that Taiwan was part of China, but it was not the U.S. government's uh, policy that was that um, uh, the territory was was part of China, and uh, and in fact the uh, Shanghai Communique that came out of that time period uh, was um, a. A very ambiguous, poorly worded, uh, difficult to, to understand document, and I'm sure that was the point. Um, so there were three communiques, each, each of which, as Richard Bush described very well in the, in the last uh, session last week, if you, if you want to understand more about that, please go ahead and, and, and see that podcast. But there are three communiques, each of which maintained that ambiguity uh, and uh, refused to walk up to the point of accepting uh, Chinese sovereignty over the uh, islands of Taiwan and uh, and Pungu, and uh, thereby preserving Truman's approach to uh, American policy and the, about the status of Taiwan. So, uh, as you would expect them to do, uh, the People's Republic of China embarked on a, a campaign. Uh, but by now, uh, Article, I'm sorry, UN General Assembly Resolution 2758 had occurred. 2758, uh, the Chinese government says. Uh, uh, acknowledges PRC sovereignty over Taiwan and the Pungu Islands. I see no way that you can uh, analyze it to come out uh, with that um, with that outcome. Uh, and I think Bonnie Glazer and Jacques Delisle have written an extraordinary paper uh, detailing why that's the case, um, despite the Chinese narrative about 2758. But the Chinese have done a very effective job within the international community and at the United Nations in uh, in in framing um, their their uh, the status of Taiwan as being under Chinese sovereignty and uh, uh, going back to the one China principle that the, that I started with um, of saying that the only legitimate government of all of China is the People's Republic of China um, and so my assessment uh, looking at uh, each of the different historical events looking at each of the different Chinese arguments about the status of Taiwan is that the best uh, uh, legal answer is that the status of Taiwan does in fact remain undetermined as a outcome of World War II. Um, it's, it's perhaps uh, tainted with unfairness, it's perhaps tainted with uh, power politics, but the law is what the law is um, and fairness is something perhaps separate. Um, so uh, the status of Taiwan, I think, as a matter of international law, is that it is undetermined. Um, and Taiwan is best uh, described as what I would call a declarative state. And so I'll leave that as a little teaser, because I know uh, uh, Catherine has some questions about what that might mean. Right. Thanks. Right. That's what we're going to spend some more time unpacking. Sure. Though. Thanks so much, Peter. That was great um, and concise. Um, so. As a starting point, because I, I don't want to presume that everybody uh, in the room or online has studied international law, so just really briefly, what does sovereignty mean and how is it established? Well, I, I think probably the best way to talk about it is how is it established. Um, sovereignty means a, a whole lot of things, but, but fundamentally it, it's, um, it's the right to govern uh, territory and to be accepted as a member of the international community, that is to say, a sovereign state and therefore member of the international community. There's two ways, two, two tests under international law that are somewhat in tension with each other. They, there's a lot of overlap between them, but there's a tension between them. Um, the first test and the, and the longest standing test is, it's called the declarative uh, test of sovereignty. It's that um, if, if a political entity, um, first of all, that there's a government, um, second of all, that there's people that it governs, third, that there's territory over which it governs, and fourth, that it is capable of engaging in international relations, then it's a sovereign 
um, and should be treated as sovereign and given all of the, um, the, the rights and privileges and obligations of sovereignty. There's a separate test, however, um, called the constitutive test. Um, and the constitutive test um, takes the first four elements and then adds the element of recognition. And it says that, well, you may have all of the elements of what's called declarative sovereignty, um, but unless other states recognize you, then you're not actually a sovereign equal to uh, the other states. That is to say, a member of the international system uh, full member of the international system of states. Mm. So that, that issue of recognition becomes very important. Mm. Why does it matter whether Taiwan is a state or a declaratory, declared state but not a constitutive state mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or a contested state? Is yeah. this just an academic debate? Well, I don't think so, actually, and I don't think the Taiwanese think so. <laughs> um, I, so um, the first and most important thing is that uh, the UN is fundamentally constitutive or consti uh, yeah, a con I'll say constituted. It's a constitutive system, right? You, in order to be a member of the United Nations, you have to be accepted as mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a constitutive system in which not all states are equal, however, right? So we have a Security Council where mm -hmm. uh, five permanent members can uh, can, can determine whether a, a, a state can be a, a sovereign. Here's how the system works. A state, that a declarative state that wants to be accepted as a full member of the international system has to send a letter to the Secretary General of the UN requesting UN membership. The Secretary General then is required to send that letter to the UN Security Council. And the Security Council then votes on whether uh, whether to allow the General Assembly to vote. Mm -hmm. And if one of the permanent five members of the Security Council um, vetoes that application, then it doesn't go to a vote at the General Assembly. So um, here we have an example in which um, China has actively prevented Taiwan from uh, being a member of, of the, you know, a constitu constitutive member of the, uh, of the international system by moving from its status as a declarative state to a constitutive state, full sovereign state and member of the international system. So obviously um, it matters in that in, unless you're accepted by first the P5 and then second by a majority of the General Assembly, should you get out of the security, your, your application get out of the Security Council, you can't become a fully recognized uh, participant in the United Nations and taking advantage of all of the, uh, the privileges and rights that, that come with that, including um, the UN Charter's um, uh, uh, um, collective self-defense components. Right, so um, so Taiwan, for instance, as a declarative state, is prevented becoming from becoming a member of the United Nations and taking advantage of the treaty rights that come with with membership in the United Nations. So it's sort of like a declarative state is a, like a second class state, yeah. a lesser state, a quasi state. I mean, you see all kinds of language around this, but but it's protected by customary international law but not under the UN Charter, so it has fewer rights? I think that's a good way of putting it, actually. So, um, yeah, there are, uh, in a sense, two tiers of states. I, I think I put that in, in my paper, right? So you have, you have uh, full state, states that are fully accepted as uh, members of the international system because they are, uh, ex they're recognized as such, so constitutive sovereignty. Um, and, and these states are, can be and are members of the United Nations and take advantage of all aspects of, of, of the international system. But there are and have always been, historically, always been other polities that are not fully recognized as, uh, you know, as, as and accepted among the, the community of states. Um, and uh, in, in modern times, we have, for instance, um, Kosovo. Kosovo is a good example of one. Uh, Palestine still, in my view, is, is a, a, it remains a declarative state because it's not allowed to be a full member of the United Nations. Um, and Taiwan is an example of a declarative state. Uh, you know, I, I'm using Taiwan uh, to mean the government on Taiwan, which I recognize is... Uh, more than just the geographic island. More than just the geographic island, right, yes. Right. So, and, and, but there are others. I mean, you can think of Somaliland, for instance, which... which um, 
is is not going to be recognized as a s separate state, despite its you know its unique uh, position within the territory of, of Somalia. Mm. Um, perhaps we can talk about that paradox later. Right. Yeah. So I checked. There is uh, an organization called the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. Ah. And they have 44 members, and these members all have some kind of a claim to be mm -hmm. a state that has not been accepted. Mm -hmm. Now, some of their claims are stronger and others weaker, but mm -hmm. yeah, so again, just to sort of highlight the fact that Taiwan is not sui generis completely, you know, off on some um, in strange, strange category of its own. But, but you were saying this matters because if you're not, if you, you're not deemed to be a state, obviously you can't participate at the UN you can't attend the General Assembly, et cetera, but you also can't participate in discussions about what international law is. You can't, you can't participate in the international bodies that are under the UN unless you're allowed to come in as an observer of some kind. Um, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan would be deemed illegal under international law if Taiwan is not a state of some kind because you're not supposed to, you know, Nicaragua, <laughs> you're not supposed to sell arms to insurgencies, um, and then, as you said, the right, the collective defense rights. So these are concrete. Yeah, I might not go quite so far as, as how you put it there, because I do think Taiwan actively participates in the development of international law mm -hmm. in various ways. Um, you know, for, for instance, I, I know Jerry Cohen has presented here uh, in the past on um, the way Taiwan participates in the development of human rights, mm -hmm. um, right, with, with uh, quite actively on a global basis, it, it, it participates in, in, in that aspect. Um, you might also think of the ways in which it uh, attempts to influence the development of, I don't know, international commercial or business law, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I do think there, there are efforts to informally um, mm -hmm. influence international law. Um, but what you're precluded from doing is, is the formal uh, influences. Like, as you say, uh, you know, the Taiwanese cannot have a judge on the International Court of Justice. They, they, uh, they cannot participate as members in the International Seabed Authority, for instance, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so it's organizationally excluded. But I, I would say still has a surprising amount of informal influence. Mm. So maybe just. Um quickly review, because I'm going to start taking questions soon since they're popping up on my phone, uh, as you may hear. Um, the possible options, if we want to say, you know, is Taiwan a state, is it not a state? Um, seems like it's too clear, yes, no, binaries, but it's not, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I avoided that question so far, primarily. Um, I... Um, you know, I, today's presentation really is about what's the status of the territory, right? So, so, and yes, it is a. I, I did, I did take it one step further and say that I think it's uh, the government on Taiwan is a declarative state, right. um, but. But fundamentally, I, I think you have a lot of different permutations, in part because there are really three different types of territory that Taiwan governs, mm. right? Or that the government, that the Republic of China's parentheses, Taiwan, governs. Um, there's, in my view, the, uh, the undetermined, the territory with an undetermined sovereign status, that's mm -hmm. Taiwan and the Pungu Islands. There's, because they were handed back from Japan, but not given to anyone. That's that's right, yeah. um, uh, and, and not not assigned by treaty mm -hmm. uh, to uh, another country. Second, um, you have you have the uh, Jinmen and Matsu, right? So you have you have territory that's uh, I don't think anyone disputes is actually Chinese territory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would include uh, Dongsha in that as well, uh, the, the uh, Pradas Reef, for instance. I think, I think uh, like Jinmen and Matsu, that has always been uh, uh, Chinese, uh, at least since the late Qing Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, Taiwan, Taiwan occupies and governs Taiping Island in the Spratlys. Mm -hmm which is contested territory, fully contested territory. Um, so you have at least three different types of territory that Taiwan actually governs, which is in part why you, why there are so many possible per, permutations, per, sorry, permutations, yes. um, that, that one could come up with about what is the government of Taiwan, uh, a government on Taiwan. Right. Maybe... Um one way to get a little bit more clarity on what you're saying about Taiwan's status would be to contrast it with another case. Mm. So, um, so you've mentioned uh, Kosovo, and then there's also Palestine. 
two other contested states mm. in the contemporary world, and there are others that are less familiar that we won't get into. Mm. Um, Palestine has been recognized as a state by, uh, I found the number 146. It sounds right, The UN yeah. General Assembly's 193 member states. So it's not a full member of the UN. It has observer status. Um, but it doesn't meet the requirements you were talking about before when I asked how do you become a state. I mean, it doesn't have a defined territory. It does not, you know, doesn't have a clear government. Um, it has a population, a fixed, I could say fi fixed population, but maybe that would also be contested because um, of the refugee camps and, and certainly now. So how did it get there um, while Taiwan with the fixed territory and the population and the government and so mm -hmm. on is not there? Yeah, I think each of the three uh, declarative states that I, that I discussed, Kosovo, Palestine, and Taiwan, has its own sort of unique set of historical circumstances that mm -hmm. led to where it is today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think it's at least debatable that Taiwan does in fact have a, I, I'm sorry, that um, uh, Palestine does in fact have a, a defined territory. It is under occupation, but it's a defined mm -hmm. uh, territory, some of which is contested. Um, that it has a uh, at various times, an effective government, um, uh, and so I think I think it's fair to say that Palestine um, would meet the declarative test for for sovereignty, um, but for the conflict that it's engaged in uh, with with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so that that would be my initial assessment. Kosovo is an uh, it's an unusual set of circumstances uh, of its own because of the disintegration of the former uh, Yugoslavia. That left, you know, that, that left a series of conflicts uh, and a series of claims over, over the, uh, the the territory of, of Kosovo as being something separate from the rest of Serbia. This also comes out of um, of, of human rights law and the, the the concepts of the responsibility to protect uh, because of the the active genocide that was occurring in uh, in Kosovo. Um, uh, you know, it, during during the conflict uh, between uh, Serbia and Bosnia over the over the um, outcome of the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, so so each one has a separate set of circumstances that led it to where it is today that make it really difficult to try to equate them. Um, but I would look I would look a little bit more closely at places too, like uh, Kurdistan, for instance. Why is Kurdistan not a separate sovereign? Why is Somaliland not a separate sovereign? Mm -hmm. And this gets back to the paradox. I don't know if you mind if I mm -hmm. mention that. But um, the paradox that, that I see in the international system today is that there's a, that there's a well, there's a tension. There's always been a tension between self-determination and res respect in international law for sovereignty. Um, respect for sovereignty is fundamentally about stability in the international system um, and uh, preventing the frequent changes of, of, of boundaries um, and, and preventing war by, by preventing the frequent changes of boundaries. But, but self-determination is what uh, comes out of the, the human rights uh, uh, law uh, and, and the idea of the, the right or the, the, the justice behind uh, self-determination of, of peoples. If, if they want to be separate from another government, then they should be separate from another government. So um, in, the, in the international system today, you see places like Somaliland and, and, and Kurdistan unable to achieve any kind of separate status because ultimately international law has come out in favor of a preference for sovereignty and stability as opposed to giving self-determination uh, to individual peoples. Um, I say that, um, but there are big exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, self-determination uh, was preferenced coming through the period of time uh, of uh, exiting out of global colonialism, colonialism um, where uh, peoples uh, that had been colonized were given uh, opportunity to exercise self-determination, um, and that was preferenced. But here, um, you, but but these really were not breaking up individual sovereigns. Like, for instance, in the case of Spain, where uh, at various times both the Basque community and the Catalans have looked for opportunities to separate um, from the rest of Spain. But preference has been given to stability uh, of borders and uh, and sovereignty. 
uh, in, in that case, right? So in the end, uh, I would say today, um, since we're largely beyond, largely beyond the period of, of colonialism, um, what, where the law has shifted to give more preference to sovereignty than to self-determination. So I want to start taking some questions. Um, and I see a hand right away in the front, please. Yeah, just a, a further on the issue of, on the issue of self-determination. It's in chart. It's part of the UN Charter. Uh, as you say, it's not really favored other than the decolonialization aspects. But on the other hand, one can, in the case of Taiwan, one can argue that for well over half a century, this was a Japanese colony. It was not part of mainland China, and, and at the end of the war, the people should have been granted the same kind of decolonialization, self-determination rights, rather than be handed over to another country, which they maybe didn't want to join. And in fact, you know, the issue of whether countries can just abrogate treaties is, you know, one argues these are unfair treaties, whatever, but after every war, including Japan, losing the Second World War, treaties are forced upon it. So the same thing happened with China after it lost the Sino-Japanese War, 1895, but 1894. But can one just abrogate treaties when you, get, when you feel you're strong enough to say, I'm not going to buy it by anymore? Um, two different um, issues there. I, I'll address them each. Um, so I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, Self-determination in terms of the status of Taiwan, actually, um, the people on Taiwan have been able to exercise self-determination uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, actually, um, in, in, uh, at least in the last, what, 30 years since they became a uh, more democratic uh, society. And, uh, and second of all, it wasn't that they were um, emerging out of China, they were emerging out of Japan, right? So in fact, um, they, they in, a, in a very real practical sense, they were given um, uh, self-determination, and perhaps that remains part of the reason behind the American approach to the ambiguity, the American policy that Richard Bush described, um, that has at its core um, this Truman policy for ambiguity has not just a legal uh, uh, backbone to it, it also has a policy backbone to it, which is um, that the American view is that uh, the people of Taiwan should be involved in the ultimate decision about, about their future. But these are political matters, right? So, so we can say that that's how it should be, um, uh, and that is how American policy, that's what American policy supports. Um, but. Uh, but fundamentally, when I look at the law of self-determination as it stands today, um, I, I'd be happy to be educated otherwise, but what I see is a pretty uh, consistent downplaying of uh, self-determination as a factor um, since the end of uh, the emergence of, of previously colonial states. Concerning abrogation, um, I did some research into, into abrogation of treaties a, as a result of, of war, and in fact, treaties can be abrogated as a result of war. Um, mostly, however, uh, international law allows treaties that have to do, for instance, with, um, with diplomatic rights or with, uh, with, with commercial uh, uh, contracts or other things that don't deal with the status of territory. The status of territory and the certainty of sovereignty over a piece of territory has such a high value in international law and in state practice regarding international law that uh, the best uh, um, uh, scholars that I could see, uh, that I could locate ab about this idea of abrogating a treaty that allocated sovereignty over territory from one country or, or the other was that it was not uh, something that could be unilaterally abrogated as a result of war, unlike the other types of treaties. Just to pick up on the self-determination question, there are some scholars who argue that, in fact, Taiwan is a state because of self-determination, and they argue their, their line of argument is that um, over the course of the democratization process, the Taiwanese people have participated in the creation of a new state. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's been self, you know, self-organized, if you will, so, you know, not organized by um, the UN, uh, but a self-organized process of self-determination that has created the new state of Taiwan. Um, now, this doesn't seem to be a mainstream view, but there are definitely more than one scholar who put this argument. I'd, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I would say, first of all, I agree Taiwan is a state, or the government on Taiwan represents a state. Declaratory state. Yes, a declaratory state, exactly. It's a declarative state, right? So, um, and um, it continues to exist um, in, in sort of rump, uh, rump fashion mm -hmm. on the territory that is indisputably Chinese, right? That is to say Jinmen and Matsu. Um, so it does, it does, it's a very interesting and complex existence that, that the government on Taiwan has because, mm -hmm. you know, yes, it came out of a, a history of, of civil war. Um, uh, and yes, it, it once governed all of China, now only governs some small offshore islands that are mm -hmm. indisputably China. Plus it also governs other territory that, that frankly, I think is either Chinese territory or Taiwanese territory, one or the other. It's not like anybody else has a claim to the territory. Mm. So I don't know. This is a really subtle point that you're making. And since we've had a, we've <laughs> had the advantage of an advanced conversation, I've been able to plumb the subtleties here. But it may be may, may be that not everybody's picking up. But Peter is making the subtle distinction between the government and its legitimacy and ownership of territory, geographic territory, right? So. So I think what I'm hearing you saying is that perhaps the government of Taiwan has a certain legitimacy through self-determination, mm -hmm. but that that doesn't mean it owns the land on which it governs. So, um, so the, <laughs> it's, the question is, what is the basis of the legitimacy, right? I think yeah. that's the best way to put it. Uh -huh. One is that, that there is a government on, on land that, uh, that, that is not sovereign uh, to any other state, right? Mm -hmm. So that's Taiwan of the Pungu Islands. Mm -hmm. So so governing on that territory as a declarative state is, is a legitimate um, separate state, I think. Mm -hmm. um, now, how do you then categorize what, what the, the government in Taipei, um, the, the authority or the legitimacy it exercises over Jin Minamatsu? How do you then rationalize that? Right, which is somewhat separate because that's the the, the thread of, of legitimacy stems from when the government in Taipei was in fact the government of all of China in Nanjing. Right, mm -hmm. so it 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 still possesses that territory mm -hmm. as a residual mm -hmm. uh, a residue of its of its time uh, as the government of all of China. And then, of course, similarly the. The Taiping Island in the South China Sea is uh, is something that the Republic of China has possessed, but not not the People's Republic of China. So there's there's various ways that you can analyze the legitimacy of the government and the separateness of it as a state, which is part of the I'm convinced of it. Part of the the way that both the government in Taiwan and the government of the United States. Um, uh, uh, use the ambiguity to cover different policy possibilities. Hmm. Well, of course, the government, the authorities on Taiwan argue that they are the Republic of China, and so therefore there is this continuity of sovereignty. Yeah. Um, and yeah. in a later talk, we are going to talk about <laughs> Taiwan status under Taiwan's own law, which yeah. is the Constitution of the Republic of China. So that that we will mostly reserve that argument for yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, for, for a future. Yeah, I, you know, it, it claims sovereignty over territory it doesn't govern. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, another question, please. Uh, can I ask you about this Treaty of San Francisco? I think a lot of literature that I reviewed started there instead of Cairo the Pasta. And, and you just, and thank you for the very good summary of all these trees. So I, I point out two different things, and, mm. as, as, and if you can shed more light, because I think you just mentioned it. Uh, one is why was Taiwan or China, Republic of China, not present? Because by then it's already in Taiwan. And secondarily, why do they, and I'm sure these people who convened the treaty are very experienced diplomats, was it intentional that they left out the sovereignty issue? 
Or can we incorporate a legal principle that was done by implication? The fact that the Republic of China government is already in full control of the island yeah. for a number of years, and therefore there was no reason to mention the handing over to the government. Yeah, so these are great questions. Well, first of all, um, it wasn't actually at the Treaty of San Francisco because um, neither China, neither the People's Republic, which had was two years old at that point, nor the Republic of China was invited to San Francisco because the victorious powers could not agree on which China to invite, right? So, um, so neither was invited. That's why there was a separate treaty. I showed two slides of treaties. The second treaty was the Treaty of Taipei, and that was um, the, the, the treaty signed between the Japanese and, and the Republic of, of China. Um, the Japanese did not recognize uh, the People's Republic of China at that point as the government of all of China, nor did the United Nations at that point, right? So, so it, that's why the, the Republic of China was uh, the, the signatory to the second treaty. As to whether it's intentional, it was very intentional um, to leave the status of the territory um, as undetermined uh, based on that uh, Truman statement of um, uh, es essentially that uh, it, by 1951, uh, the Republic of China, to whom the United States had agreed to give the territory, was no longer the government de facto of all of China, even though it was still recognized as such, it was not the government of all of China. That's number one. Number two, um, it was in the context of the Cold War. And Truman, it was in the interest of the United States to have uh, Taiwan remained separate from the mainland uh, because it, there was a, a struggle between communism and, and uh, the West and, um, and the close connection between Mao and Stalin at that period was of serious concern to, um, to Truman. And so, yes, it was very intentional that um, the United States and, and to, at that time, Britain also ensured that this situation occurred where uh, sovereignty was relinquished by Japan but not reassigned in the treaty. And so um, it was intentional and, and not meant to be a transfer by implication. Well, can, can you make an argument that, you know, it, it, is, it doesn't need to be mentioned because it's implied? It, it did have a government at the time. So I think um, certainly one can make that argument. Um, personally, I don't find it persuasive, but one can make the argument. And, um, you know, in the court of uh, international public opinion, I'm not the one you have to persuade. <laughs> this uh, tees up a question we received yeah. from online um, asking about exactly what happened when Truman made that shift that you highlighted. So the questioner is pointing out that the last document covering or addressing the status of Taiwan was, you know, we had Cairo and we had Potsdam. Um, and then Truman made a change in policy. Yeah. So the question is whether Pi Cairo and Potsdam were not legal documents mm -hmm. having legal force, and Truman, with a change in policy, was in effect changing the outcome of international law. So what is the interaction between law and policy that takes place there between from Cairo to Potsdam to Truman saying, actually, we're not going to we're not going to carry out Cairo. We're not going to carry out Potsdam. Yeah. So I mean, this is a fair it's a fair argument, frankly, to say it's a fair argument to say that um, the agreement at Cairo, the agreement at Potsdam, and the sign signature of Japan at the surrender agreement uh, that resulted in an acceptance of the terms of Potsdam um, should be considered a treaty in its sum total. Mm. Um, I think that's, as I, as I have read the law and the analysis about the law, that is not the best uh, analysis in light of the law as to whether that amounted to a treaty. But it certainly is a reasonable argument. Mm. And in fact, it's one that the PRC makes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Right, that is one of their routes by which they claim. And again, we'll have another right. session talking about the PRC's law on Taiwan and how it makes its claim. But that is one of their routes to saying. That's right. And therefore, Taiwan is part of. That's right. That 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 that, that there is a that there was a treaty transfer based on the sum total of the agreements. Now, the you know the United States and the United Kingdom um, said, well, no, that's 
you know, th these were political agreements that, that were, um, that, that existed in the context of um, uh, policies about a future uh, outcome that were planned given the circumstances at the time. Circumstances changed, and therefore the policy changed, was sort of the, is, is both the American and the, and the British point of view uh, from the 1950s. Hmm. So I'm, I'm going to take another one from online. Um, what are the implications of your argument for the status of the Taiwan Strait? Oh. Um, <laughs> um, Another can of worms. <laughs> it really, it's a bit of a can of worms. So um, I, I am of the view, uh, I'll just lay this one out, out front, um, that uh, the claims of the People's Republic of China about the Taiwan Strait are quite normative. In other words, they comply with international law. There are many other people who don't agree with that, but I, I think that the People's Republic of China claims that there's um, baselines, there's a territorial sea, uh, and there's exclusive economic zone uh, in the middle of, of, of the strait. Um, they, don't, they don't say it's not an international strait. Um, uh, uh, so so um, I think they're pretty normative. When they object to the passage of warships through it, I think what they're really objecting to is the political signaling um, about warships passing through the strait that's intended to um, I interfere, from B Beijing's point of view, in what, in Beijing's point of view, is a domestic matter. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the first thing to say about it. The second thing to say is that um, it wouldn't change the status of the straits at all if Taiwan were to be a separate state from the mainland. It doesn't change the status of the strait. Mm. There's still baselines in territorial sea and exclusive economic zone. Uh, uh, baselines in territorial sea on either side of the strait with an with a area of exclusive economic zone, which is to say high seas freedoms in the middle of the strait. So uh, an international strait is not one that has two countries, uh, one on either side. It can be one country, it can be two countries, three countries, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the Strait of Malacca has three countries, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. It's still an international strait. Um, and, and, uh, and, and there are international straits that have one country on that's the right. side. That's right. There are international straits that, um, uh, yes, I, I, I will say yes to that. It's mm -hmm. complicated, but yes. Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, another question about when the Japanese relinquished their sovereignty over Taiwan with, at the, with the signing of the peace treaty, um, doesn't it make sense that it would go back to China since it had been taken from China? So this is the retrocession um, mm. argument that um, uh, essentially China, China makes the same argument uh, mm -hmm. that, that fundamentally the, um, the three agreements amount to a um, a treaty and uh, sufficient to transfer the territory and the actual um, acceptance of Japanese surrender by the Chinese forces in Taipei, the picture I showed you, um, is a retrocession, that is to say, a, a, mm -hmm. a ceding back of mm -hmm. territory mm -hmm. to its previous owner. Um, again, that's not what international law actually says. <laughs> international law says it's got to be explicit in a treaty because of the preference uh, in international law for sovereignty and, and certainty about sovereignty over territory. Uh, Frank? And please turn on your mics as you ask your questions. Sure. I guess I'm a bit confused on how you use the term declarative state uh, because prior to this I've never used, heard it used in yeah. international law and I've been teaching it quite some time. So a couple of points where perhaps I misunderstand. The Montevideo Convention is the one that discusses what is a state. It is also the same convention that says there is only one legitimate view, and it's the declarative theory, not the constitutive theory, because, of course, those Latin American states were saying, and you, U.S., have been dictating who you think is a state and violating the declarative theory for way too long. And so my understanding is that pretty much everybody, including the US, in its foreign relations restatement and in its practice, says that it adheres to the declarative theory. 
and that the question of recognition is only relevant to the fourth point of whether or not you can conduct foreign relations, because let's face it, if nobody comes to the table when you proclaim that you have the power to conclude a treaty uh, because they don't recognize you, then that suggests you don't have that fourth element. And how does then the US uh, deal with its failure to recognize what is an entity that fulfills objectively those four criteria? Mm -hmm. Well, the foreign relations statement says you're not obligated to diplomatically recognize anyone, but you have to treat an entity that objectively fulfills it in a way that doesn't make its people stateless, doesn't interrupt the ability of other states to recognize it. That's the compromise there. And therefore, I guess I don't understand what you mean by a declarative state. And so what some people might understand you to mean is a state that has declared its independence as, say, Kosovo has, as accepted by the ICJ. Now, you can correct me, but I don't think Taiwan has done that. It doesn't proclaim itself to be an independent state. It is in this weird, uh, you would call it unique zone. The other point that I would say, the point of clarification, is self-determination. At least since the General Relations Friendly Relations uh, Resolution, it has been widely accepted that the external self-determination is limited to formerly colonial states. You can achieve external self-determination if you are part of an existing state, mm -hmm. only if you demonstrate that you have been totally denied political rights, language rights, and therefore the situation is extremely rare case where an entity within a state can do that. And the leading case would be the Supreme of Canada declaring that Quebec can't claim external self-determination because it, those people in Quebec have been fully a part of the government in Canada, etc. And so therefore, in that context, what many people say is people are entitled under self-determination rights, including the human rights regimes, to internal self-determination within existing states and therefore, that means that you are able to exercise all those other rights inside the state. And you could have all sorts of systems by which that happens without an external independence. So I do think self-determination is important here. I'm not sure how it applies to a, a entity that says it is governing function over a territory but does not proclaim independence. So I think I would avoid the term declarative state. So I'm puzzled by what you actually mean. I don't th I, I, I'm not sure you're puzzled. I think you might disagree. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, so um, and that's okay, actually. Uh, so I, you're right, I do uh, mean that uh, there are political entities that meet the, the four-part test of uh, a declarative uh, sovereign, sovereignty, but are not well recognized in the international system and, able, and therefore not able to take full part in uh, international societies. Well, OK. But look, <laughs> keep in mind that if you're using Article 4 of the Charter for that proposition, Article 4 says the state being a state is only one of the criteria. And therefore, you also have to be able and willing to fulfill the UN Charter. And so for the history of the UN, the most often used criteria is not, you don't qualify as a state, but because you're at war, you're violating human rights, you refuse to recognize our POWs in Vietnam. Uh, all of that suggests that you are not fulfilling the criteria of international law. Therefore, yes, we, you are a state, but you're not fulfilling the able and, and willing, which is basically a political criteria that we add on to this. And that does serve a bit to distinguish Palestine's admission, for example, to UNESCO, where the only thing there is, are you a state? And therefore, UNESCO thinks, well, sort of satisfy that, so 
but we won't go with the next step of are you in full compliance with international law. And so you do have, I think, Palestine and the recognition by the GA that it's a one of the few observer state is a recognition that Palestine, for example, is a state, but it does not fulfill the political criteria added in Article 4, which means that the US can still say, yeah, you don't fulfill that political criteria, which turns on my veto power, so we're not we're keeping you out. So um, back to declarative state. Um, yes, I think it means, uh, as I use it, and frankly, there's a fair literature about this, that um, that that it, it is a category of states that have um, met the Montevideo test but are not well accepted by the rest of the international community. There's a, a, a rich discussion, frankly, uh, for a couple hundreds of years about, about polities that are not fully recognized but that do have protections of international law as some sort of second level uh, sovereign. Um, it, it, it's, that's number one. Number two, um, the Republic of China on Taiwan does consider itself a separate independent state. That's why when I was talking earlier, yes, um, when I was talking earlier about it, its uh, uh, territorial, um, the uniqueness of the three types of territory over which it governs, this is how in part it's able to, to maintain that claim, that it is, it claims the, the authority to govern all of China and a government of a portion of China, plus some in Taiwan say uh, that, that uh, China is the sovereign over uh, Taiwan and the Pungu Islands. The KM, that was the KMT position uh, up until uh, probably about 20 years ago, actually. So, so Taiwan does consider itself an, uh, an independent state as the Republic of China. Um, and uh, I would also point out that fundamentally, you know, what you're saying about Article 4 of the Charter is undoubtedly true, but it's, it's also a matter of power um, and the P5's decision making about who gets to be a member of the uh, Security Council and, and, and who doesn't. Um, I don't think anyone uh, would say that, tai, that, that the Republic of China on Taiwan um, is unwilling or unable to fulfill uh, the obligations of, uh, of, of paragraph or, or Article 4, unwilling or unable to do it, um, were they given the chance. But they're not given the chance uh, because of the veto power of one of the P5s. To be discussed. Okay, yeah. that's good. <laughs> okay, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our hour. Um, so thank you so much, Peter, for this sure. <laughs> elucidation of what is yeah. clearly an extremely complicated question. A lot of questions that have come up actually will be addressed further in the future episodes of this series because we're going to have guests, as I said, uh, explaining um, the question of Taiwan status under UN law, under PRC law, and under the law of the Republic of China. So that will be a chance to come back with some of these questions. Um, and meanwhile, just a final note, next Friday, November 15th, uh, 11 a.m. New York time, we're going to have a conversation about Nippon Steel's proposal to purchase U.S. Steel. And uh, both political parties here in the United States during the election campaign expressed uh, concern about the purchase, if not outright opposition to the purchase. Uh, it's possible that it was just temporarily hijacked by our election campaign, but now that that's over, what's going to happen? We're going to be uh, discussing all of that next Friday. I hope we'll see some of you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.